Greetings gamers, my name is Anto and over the last six months or so I've been working on a new campaign setting called the Jewel Cities of Talabar. For the last couple of years I've been running a campaign in the desert nation of Ashk. I have a whole playlist on me making that campaign setting right up here but for the last six months I've been working on my next setting. Most of this work has been done over on Twitch, there'll be a link down in the description for you to come and follow me but today I want to show you what I've given my players to prepare them for this new campaign and then give you a little bit of an overview of the world. So here we are in the Traveler's Guide to the Jewel Cities. This is my player's guide, this is the document that I have sent to my players to introduce them to this new campaign world. I've made a video in the past talking about how I make these kinds of documents, but I want to go through this one and show you specifically what I have conveyed to the players in anticipation of our new campaign. This document was made in Affinity Publisher. The Affinity Suite is what I use to do all of my graphic design work. I get asked about it all the time. I'll leave a link down in the description below to where you can find the Affinity Suite, but let's dive into it. So. The very first page is our map. This was made using Incarnate. I do have a video planned covering Incarnate that's gonna come out at some point in the future, but we made this map in Incarnate over the course of many months through many revisions, and that's been one of the most fun parts of this whole process for me is the revision aspect to it. Here you can see the original map of the Jewel Cities. This is a cropped in version from my world map. I chose an area of my world map that I wanted my next campaign to be in and I just cropped in on it. So this was the very first version of the Jewel Cities map. And then this is our current version. This is the 22nd revision to this map. So this is our opening splash page in our traveler's guide, our player's guide to the Jewel Cities. It lays out the landscape that the player's going to be playing in, gives them the labels of all the different nations in which they might adventure and gives them just a general idea of what things look like in this part of the world. Then we come to our introduction, welcome to the Jewel Cities kind of thing, and we go straight into it. We start with time and the calendar. I chose to do this because I've talked before about how important I think tracking time is for the Dungeon Master and being able to weave intricate narratives between different events by tracking the time of them. But one thing that I've noticed, especially in my current campaign, is when you're using made up words for your months, the players have no idea where they are in the month. So I am familiar with the calendar that I had in my world, but my players were only experiencing this like once a week at most. So when I would say a month name, say it's the 7th of Fortis, they have no idea where that is in the year. This is broadly, you know, 364 day year, I think it is. So it's kind of analogous to Earth, but they have no idea where that is in the year. They have no frame of reference. And when you're using made up day names as well, it kind of becomes meaningless to them. So one of the things that I wanted to do with the calendar in this go around was I wanted to rename uh, most of the months so that they had a relation to the seasons because if you think about a medieval commoner they're not going to care necessarily what the month specifically is they're probably going to care about the passage of time in relation to harvests and winter and the first frost and the first snowfall so i decided to name my months after those touchstones throughout the seasonal year. If we jump over to the next page quickly, you can see that. So we have the Ishtar calendar. Ishtar is the world that my campaigns take place in. And you can see that we have snowfall, midwinter, dawn, bloom, midspring, solace, calor, midsummer, sunfall, harvest, reaping, stormfall, and frostfall. You don't necessarily need to know where you are in the year. If you know you're in snowfall, you're in the winter somewhere. If you know that you're in sunfall, you're at the end of summer, and that's going to help give the players a lot more context as to where they are in the year. Solus and Kalil are original names from my first go around of the calendar, and they are the months that the players started both my last campaigns in, so they are familiar with where they fall in the year. So I just left them as they were. So that's our time and calendar. Introduce the concepts of the different days and the different months, give them the calendar that they can use to reference, including some holidays good to go. Next we come to the ages of the world. This is how I like to categorize long periods of time in ages. So the current age in which this next campaign will be taking place is the age of chaos that began during my current campaign when the players opened Pandora's box and unleashed the apocalypse. Now whether or not they successfully 
put the apocalypse back in the box or not is irrelevant they have started the age of chaos that is when our next campaign is going to be taking place but you can see going back through time we have different ages marked by significant events so we have the age of light which starts after the end of my first campaign and runs until the middle of my second campaign everything before that is the age of darkness and wonder and conquest discovery creation the age of the gods and the primordial age and that stretches back well beyond written history the benefit of doing this is it gives the players some kind of context for how old things are and gives them some information as to kind of the formation of the world they might encounter some ancient artifacts out in the world and someone could reference oh this is from the age of wonder and they would know oh this is from several thousand years removed from where we are now next we come to the regions of the jewel cities this is a brief summary of each of the nations that make up this campaign setting that we're going to be playing in. So we'll go back to the map to refer to that. So we have the Dusk Empire. The Dusk Empire once ruled nearly all of the continent of Talavar, which is the continent the Jewel Cities are on. But in the very recent times, the Subjugator, who was the emperor of this empire, was betrayed by his wife, the Lady of Dusk, and she killed him. And she has fled back over to the Jewel Cities. And now the empire is in this state of turmoil and infighting and there's a load of political drama and intrigue relating to that then we have the unclaimed lands this is the empire name for the region called ngawe this is a vast jungle rainforest kind of location filled with ancient magics and an absolutely immense variety of peoples and ancestries and it's called the unclaimed lands because the empire never claimed it the empire could never break in and conquer it so the empire calls it the unclaimed lands it's actually called Ngawe. then we have the howling badlands this used to be an elven dominion called eltrith and there was a group of dwarves called the cinder dwarves who discovered a magical kind of geode here that they wanted conflict with the elves that resulted in basically like a magical nuke being detonated that magically irradiated the entire area turned it from what was once a lush and verdant forest into a red sand blasted wasteland then we have the island of Orr, which is where most of our nations are starting with Eildal, which is kind of a classic medieval fantasy land sword and sorcery knights in shining armor everything that you would typically expect from your forgotten realms ish setting next there is eruxus this is where the lizard folk live they live in kind of a conclaved nation that has a single public road that cuts through it and all traffic that wants to move through there has to stick to that road and anyone that kind of deviates is severely punished then we come to the expanse this is the large central stretch of the region the most notable thing about the expanse is that nobody really wants it it's very resource deprived Whereas the rest of the Island of Ore and the rest of the Jewel Cities is quite rich in resources, particularly precious gems and jewels and metals. Whereas the Expanse, the center stretch of the island, is pretty much worthless, so nobody bothers to fight for control over the land. So it's constantly changing hands legions of petty kings and minor nobles and shifting borders but no one really cares enough to say this land is ours then we come to novaris novaris is the spiritual successor to the nation of my first campaign our first campaign took place in a place called valoroth and at the end of that campaign again thanks to the players choices and mistakes they blew the country up they shattered it and created the shattered isles thousands of little islands that have been kind of crumbled apart from the mainland and this obviously caused a lot of people to flee the nation and some of them ended up on the island of or in the jewel cities and they established novaris so this is very valorosi in its preclusions very draconic a lot of dragonborn here a lot of draconic language a lot of kind of latin influence because latin is the analog for my draconian language in my setting so a lot of latin place names a lot of kind of classical 
Roman architecture inspiration and all that kind of stuff. Then we come to the Vale. The Vale is one of the smaller areas on the island of Law, but it is one of the most powerful. It is isolated from the rest of the region by a giant series of cliffs known as the shield and then water on all the other sides it is rich in resources both metals and precious gems and then in the recent past there has been a war with novaris over a resource called time stone a particular mineral that came down via a meteor strike and that allows people to use it for kind of chronomancy and time magic so novaris and the veil vale had a big old war over that the veil vale one and that has made them incredibly wealthy and powerful. Then at the top of all we have the Hinterlands. They are renowned for being quite cruel. The kings of Hinter have subjugated people, have dominated peoples and have a reputation for being quite cruel. One of their victims was the small nation of Hirondale. They had their own language and their own culture that was kind of absorbed and erased by the hinterlands for a long time and then in the recent-ish past they won their independence and are now trying to re-establish that culture that was taken away from them so hirondale is very much inspired by kind of the stories of wales and the welsh culture with the look of 16th century france everyone's got gorgeous gowns and very musketeer vibes. So our setting guide just gives the players an overview of each of these regions. It gives them kind of a description of what's going on in the region and then gives them a couple of points of things that they would know about the region. So in the Vale, it talks about the Time Stone Wall. In Erexus, it talks about the Gold Road, that road, that one road that people are allowed to travel on. And this gives the players a single point of reference that they can go, right, okay, I know what that place is because I have its most important feature in my mind. I know that Erexus is lizard folk and the Gold Road. I know that the Vale is timey-wimey, magical rock stuff and the Maiden Queen. Then we come to some discussion on the people of the Jewel Cities. Now, I'll be running this setting in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, but the game system that you use for this doesn't really matter to the approach that you take. I just wanted to give my players a list of common ancestries that they can freely choose from, uncommon ancestries that are going to be less frequent but they can still choose from and then a note that everything else is a rare ancestry and if they want to play one of those ancestries they need to bring it up beforehand so that we can talk about how to incorporate them into this world that common uncommon and rare motif carries on pretty much throughout the rest of this booklet moving into the gods this is something i did in my last campaign document i give an overview of each of the gods give them their domains their names their alignments and a tiny little introduction to them so that if we have any players that are playing pious characters they have a direction for gods to choose from and gods that they want to know more about and then we come to the last section which is one of the most important i think and that's what people know this whole section is about giving players information that their characters would already have just by being in this region so because the Pathfinder system predominantly uses the silver standard of currency versus gold, I wanted to establish that really early on and start drilling it into the players that they need to get used to using silver. So the currency in the Jewel Cities is the Talavarin Labor. That is a silver piece that is cast in such a way that it can be broken into 10 individual bits they are worth about a copper each and then gold doesn't really exist for most common people a laver has a hole in it so you can string 10 of them together into a crown and that is worth one gold piece but most people just aren't going to see a gold piece so that's going to give me a really good in-universe way to develop our player characters from going to having a couple of silver in their pockets to eventually getting to the point when they can carry gold but they won't be able to spend it a lot of places because you know peasantry won't won't cut gold and this is another way to help the players feel like this is both a real place help with that very similitude but also to help them get used to the differences and the culture of this land so we have the laver we have a cape which is half a laver five bits and then we have the bit and in using those words and that language in our conversation with npcs we can help develop this as a living and breathing feeling setting so instead of going into a shop to order a mug of ale and the barkeep says that'll be three copper 
the barkeep will say that'll be three bits. And it's the same thing, just a different word, helps get them into the set. Then we have a note on languages. Something I really wanna do in my next campaign is really play with languages a lot more. I've found that in my last two campaigns, characters that speak different languages don't really get a lot of benefit from that because most of their interactions happen in the common language. And I really wanted to move away from that and show some of that linguistic diversity and give players a reason to take other languages. So for each of my regions, I have made a note of what the dominant language is and also what are some other common languages in that area. So for example, in Novaris, there's Talavari common, which is our default common language, but there's also Draconic, which is our Valorosi language from those refugees that came over after the end of our first campaign. And to express this, we've got a couple of tables. We've got common languages of the dual cities and uncommon languages of the dual cities. And the players can choose any of their common languages. Their ancestry might give them access to uncommon languages, but otherwise they're gonna to need to speak to me about why their character knows one of these uncommon languages. Then we have a section on magic. I think that it's important if you're playing a game where magic is prevalent to contextualize how magic is viewed in the world. So in the dual cities, the common people are all aware of magic. Even if they've never seen it, they've heard enough about powerful spellcasters like the subjugator who used incredible magics to dominate most of the continent. They're aware of magic casters. And then we go into a little bit of detail on the different magical practices within Pathfinder 2nd edition. So we've got the Arcane, Divine, Occult and Primal spell lists. And then one thing that I wanted to do in this campaign is I really wanted to elevate spellcasters to almost like Jedi levels. So if you think to episode one, Phantom Menace, when Qui-Gon and Anakin are having that exchange about the lightsaber and Qui-Gon is like, well, how do you know I didn't kill a Jedi to take his lightsaber? And Anakin, without skipping a beat, is just so sure that you couldn't kill a Jedi. You've got a lightsaber, therefore you must be a Jedi. And I really wanna capture that with spellcasters and have the spellcasting focus kind of act as that status symbol and that talisman of being a spellcaster. If someone sees you with a spellcasting focus, they assume you are a caster. Then we have a section on folklore and tradition. I think this is another important thing to include to help your players feel like this is a living world. We've got some information on the cut, which is the channel of water that separates the main continent of Talavar from the island of Or, and just some kind of superstitions around how that formed. Then we have information on the free companies. The free companies of Talavar were once how pretty much all of the military of this continent operated, all hired mercenaries. But then thanks to the subjugation and that kind of sweeping across the continent, there are very few of them left. This is an avenue that I think my players are gonna follow. I think they're gonna choose to be members of a beleaguered free company. Then we have the names of memory. This is just a reference that one of the traditions that people in this region have is they believe once you die, your memory lives on so long as people speak your name. So there are many places where they have kind of name saying ceremonies where they'll have big groups of people and a priest or a village elder will read the names of the deceased maybe once a year and that keeps the memory of those people alive. And then to finish off we've just got a little bit about pastimes. So we obviously have drinking, all players are going to go and want to go to the tavern and do some drinking so we've got some information on that. Then we have gambling of course players love to gamble and we've got information on a couple of different common gambling games within the region and then we have the jewel city's premier sport gorgon gorgon is a little mini game that i've been working on it's kind of like a blood bowl fantasy football-esque game there is a scoring ball and a number of gorgon balls which petrify people when you throw them at them and the goal is to score as many points as you can before the other team scores as many points as they can and not get petrified in the process but of course that's only one part of the puzzle that's what the players have seen that's not all that i've been doing to work on the dual cities like i said for the last six months i've been streaming every week over on twitter and we've been developing this world. So if we jump over to the Legend Keeper page for this world, you can see I have been very busy. There are over 550 pins currently on this map to denote locations, points of interest, monsters, magic items, specific locations, magical occurrences, all kinds of stuff. We have been working over the course of those six months in the streams to really create a living, breathing world from the Jewel Cities. Most of these pins are hidden and only I can see them, but all the ones that are 
shown to the players each have some kind of information. So we'll go into the city of Shadar here and you can see that this blue box here that is always shown to the players as well as anything not in a colored box and then anything in the purple boxes is secret so in pretty much all of the pages they're set out like this we have some player facing information kind of a, a from the setting guide here is what your characters would know without needing to roll anything and that's very important because i give my players access to this legend keeper and i say to them go read read whatever you want if it's in a blue box your character knows it and it is an assumed knowledge you don't need to roll for it and then if we go into the main page here you can see if we click on the desk empire as an example i have some knowledge dcs so all the stuff in the blue is stuff the players would know or have access to that information but then i can make notes of here is stuff that they will need to roll and won't necessarily know about this region, this area, this city, this settlement, whatever it is. So I'll give you a little overview of how I've structured these pins because it's one of the things I get asked about in stream all the time. What are all the colors and shapes and what do all, they all mean? So we'll start with our black pins with the globe icon. Those denote a nation. So we have the Desk Empire, the Unclaimed Lands, the Howling Badlands, etc. And that gives me a place to put all the information about the nation level stuff. So you can see Desk Empire, tons of information already about this region, much of it secret that the players aren't going to see. We also have a tab for kind of organization and figuring out the structure of the government and things like that. Then if we zoom in here a little bit, these purple icons that are like banner shaped, those reference cities. So again, the jewel cities, cities is part of the name. A lot of the wealth and a lot of the population in this region have condensed into these cities, many of which, but not all, but many of which are named after specific minerals or precious materials that they are known for. So the city of Opal, particularly known for its opal reserves and things like that. It's very on the nose, but it makes sense with how humans particularly name things. The number of places, certainly within the UK, that are just called Hill Hill in different languages. Then we have our rounded pink icons. These are for set locations of a specific type. So if it's a location that isn't a city and isn't a town or village, but is specific, so say a statue to a particular god, a planar portal, a shrine to something, a mine, a rubic mine. Those are all in pink rounded icons. Our villages get kind of a goldy colored rounded icon with signposts on them, same as our towns. Magic items are this little chest shaped icon. They are green in color and then they have a different image on them depending on what they are. So if it is a weapon, they have a sword. If it is a kind of generic piece of magical gear it has these little stars or if it's some kind of treasure that doesn't fall into another category it has a little treasure chest symbol then we come to our points of interest most of these are quest hooks and they are less set in place so most of them have been put on the map with the intention of being in one place but they are easily moved so for example if we click down here we have the quest hook change in places the party wake up in the wrong bodies one of them potentially is a picture of infinite water a plasmoid and they need to figure out what happened so all of these little question mark white question mark icons are plot hooks so some of them will be in depth actual full session plot hooks but others of them are just kind of random encounters so we've got one here some traveling members of the order of the silver gauntlet which is one of the free companies it's just a reference that if the players are moving along this road through this forest they will encounter a few members of the order of the silver gauntlet and there will be a social exchange it's very unlikely to develop into a combat encounter but it helps the world feel real because there are so many of these instances everywhere no matter where the players go no matter what hex they're in i want there to always be something for them to interact with and that's a big part of what we've been doing in the streams it's a big part of what we've been doing particularly on all you can see most of the hexes on all which is where the players are going to start have been filled out then we come to these red icons with a skull those are monster locations so that could either be a monster roam in the countryside or it could be a monster's lair and a lot of these have 
have been pulled from the bestiaries from Pathfinder. So we've gone through the various bestiaries and the different source books and placed a whole bunch of specific monsters there. So we've always got some ideas as to how to progress with our storyline. And then we have our natural location. So specific places like the, the Weld of Masks, which is a woodland, has this little square brown icon. And then if it's a resource, so say coal or oil, we have little rounded icons that mention what the resource is. When you put all of this together, it means that I can drop my players anywhere in this world, put them down and I will have some guidance and some direction as to where to go for their specific quest. So let's zoom out here and zoom all the way out and we'll choose just a random place. So we're gonna go right here. So we zoom in, they're starting in this hex. The closest thing to this hex is a pirate standoff. So if the players were traveling in this hex, they would come across three pirates in a gun standoff and they are arguing over a kind of buried treasure. This buried treasure will lead them across the Jewel Cities. It is a complex quest, for lack of a better word. Standoff between three pirates around a recently unburied chest full of booty in the middle of them. Contains 200 labor, minor healing potion and a map. They were spice runners who spent near a decade in prison in Jasper. When they were released, they all rushed to the closest buried cache they could to get the map that points them to the buried treasure. And you can see Jasper is a location and buried treasure is another pin on the map. Where a magic item stored that would allow the pirates to disguise themselves as King Halfdan of Eildal and access the royal vaults. So this is a fairly complex quest. Bunch of pirates have been in prison, they've got out, they wanna get a map. That map is gonna take them to some buried treasure that will give them access to magically transform themselves into the king of a nation so they can steal the royal vaults. And that is just a random encounter that exists in the world, but is tied to other elements of the dual cities. Now we take that and we compound that by 550 pins and suddenly we've got a really complex interconnected web of a world that no matter where we drop the players there will be inspiration and starting points and guidelines and maybe whole quests ready for them to find. And don't get me wrong this is a significant amount of upfront work on the part of the dungeon master. I would not do this for a random group. I wouldn't do this if I didn't have a group locked in that I've played with for many years who I know well because the chances of doing this for a group of randoms and it falling through and having no campaign are just too great. But if you have a solid and steady group, this is an excellent way to approach building a new campaign because I'm doing all the work up front. When it comes to running this game, my week to week prep is gonna be so light because I've got so much direction on the map already. So there we have it folks, that's my introduction to the Jewel Cities. If you are interested in the Jewel Cities, I will leave links to both the Twitch stream in the description below, as well as our Discord server. We have a Jewel Cities channel there where I post updates in the week. And I'll also leave a link to my Patreon down below. All the patrons at the $10 level get access to that setting guide for the Jewel Cities, as well as the map so that you can pour over it for inspiration and maybe run your own games in the region. And also check out the video I made on the doppelganger system, which is the world building method I use to develop a lot of this stuff. But until next time, happy gaming.